All right, so that is an article, uh, that's part of an article I shared with you before back in April. Schools keep teaching slavery and civil rights history in ways that traumatize black students. And that's from Vox.com. Now, when we look at um, the first article that I saw dealing with the study from the Southern Poverty Law Center, this, this article is from theatlantic.com, theatlantic.com, okay? And it's called Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. And what I'm going to do, let's flip over here to uh, the screen share. And this is one of the things that we talk about in the new online course that I'm going to do. Uh, it's a 16-hour, eight-session online course. It starts uh, Saturday, June 8, 2019. We'll start at, uh, I think it's going to be about 4 p.m. Uh, it's called Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, What They Didn't Teach You in School. Okay, and this is a new revised, uh, this is a new revised version of this online course. The last time I taught it was uh, September of 2019. We do this online at our online school. It's not on Facebook, it's at our online school. And uh, you can watch from around the, around the world in this archive there. You can go back and watch it over and over again. For more information about the class, email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Let me turn on the screen share here, and uh, you can see the, because uh, I have a couple of slides here, and these are some of the uh, slides we do within the online class, but I want to talk about this article from... Um, from the Atlantic.com, because this was the first article I saw about this study. Let's turn on the screen share and let's go to uh, let's go to this slide. How's everybody doing today? Where are we? Right here. Okay. What kids are really learning about slavery? A new report finds that the topic is, is mistaught and often sentimentalized and students are alarmingly misinformed as a result. Now this statue that you see here, this is uh, the Lincoln Emancipation Statue. It's in Washington, DC. It was erected in 1876. It was paid for by former enslaved people. And the statue has been criticized for representing the history of slavery from a paternalistic perspective. OK, uh, but very quickly here, some of the problems that they found with the way slavery is taught is that uh, uh, they teach slavery without context, preferring to present the good news before the bad. They tend to subscribe to a progressive view of American history that can that can acknowledge acknowledge flaws only to the extent that they have been addressed and solved, meaning not a not acknowledge the flaws that still exist as legacies of slavery. Um, slavery is taught about the, uh, we teach about the American enslavement of Africans as an exclusively Southern institution when all of the 13 colonies, including what will become the Northern states, had slavery as well. When you're talking about Maryland, when you're talking about, uh, there, was, there was slavery also in Michigan, even though it was one of the 13 colonies. Um, but New York, okay. Uh, when you have Wall Street, all the 13 colonies uh, had slavery. Uh, we rarely connect slavery to the ideology that grew up to sustain and protect white supremacy. And the ideology of white supremacy predates slavery. Now, it wasn't called white supremacy prior to the transatlantic slave trade starting right around 1440 with the Portuguese, but that ideology of European dominance, European superiority, and cultural superiority that existed, okay? And, and white supremacy gives birth to the power structure, which is racism. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race. Uh, we are also, we, uh, number five, we often rely on pedagogy poorly suited to the topic. Uh, uh, when we ask teachers to tell us about their favorite lesson uh, uh, when teaching about slavery, dozens proudly reported classroom simulations. See, this is, they're telling you seven key problems with the current way slavery is taught. This is right from uh, the, this is from the article from Atlantic.com, but this is from the study from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Stu teachers, pro uh, dozens proudly reported classroom simulations. Wrong. 
Simulation of traumatic experiences is not shown to be effective as a learning strategy and can harm vulnerable children. Six, we, we rarely connect slavery to the ideology that grew up to sustain and protect white supremacy and racism. Okay, I have that in there twice for some reason, maybe because it's important. Uh, we tend to center on the white experience when we teach about slavery. It's recommended to read slave narratives. It's recommended to read slave narratives, okay? All right, so now when we look at the, um, let me close that, come out of the screen share. All right, so when we look at this article very briefly from uh, theatlantic.com, and this is the first article I saw dealing with this study, they talk about how examining the teacher's uh, survey results, because they also surveyed 1,700 social studies teachers as well, okay? Um, let me back up a little bit. Let's look at the previous prayer paragraph. The student's results, which the report labels dismal, extend beyond factual errors to a failure to grasp key concepts underpinning the nature and legacy of slavery. Fewer than one quarter or only 22% of participating high school seniors knew that quote, protections of slavery were embedded in American founding documents like the US Constitution, uh, end quote, that rather than a, a peculiar institution of, of the South, slavery was a constitutionally enshrined right. And fewer than four in 10 uh, students surveyed, only 39% understood how slavery, quote, shaped the fundamental beliefs of Americans about race and whiteness. So when you have high school seniors, that don't understand this basic history. And all this deals with the legacy of slavery and how slavery has greatly impacted this country, maldistributed wealth, power, and resources. You're dealing with the Constitution. That's dealing with law. That's dealing with policies, okay? 30, uh, only 39% understood how slavery, quote, shaped the fundamental beliefs of Americans' race and whiteness, end quote. Well, your thoughts create feelings. Your feelings create actions and behaviors. Your actions and behaviors create results. Your thoughts create feelings. Your feelings create actions and behaviors. Your actions and behaviors create results. That influences who people vote for at the, at the ballot box. This influences the policies that people advocate for. This, this influences the policies that people advocate for, okay? Uh, all of this, this influences where people get their news from, like Fox News. So all of this is interconnected and interrelated. This is why the history has to be correctly taught. Now, examining the teacher's survey results might help explain why students struggle to answer questions on American enslavement. Okay, and let me pull this up. Uh, let me pull this up on the computer also. How's everybody doing today? Uh, and when they have current events, I know school is out, so uh, maybe summer school or something like that. If they have uh, current events, uh, if they, they have students bring in articles for current events, bring in this article from NBC News dealing with uh, what happened in uh, with the slave auction, the mock slave auction. Okay, have kids bring in articles and talk about that because that's extremely important also. Okay, what are kids learning about slavery? Let's uh, look at this article here. I pulled it up. Okay, so examining teacher survey results might help explain why students struggle to answer questions on American enslavement. Educators are struggling themselves. Educators are not properly equipped on how to teach the history of slavery. They're not properly equipped on teaching history, period, in many cases, but especially the history of slavery. While teachers overwhelmingly, 92% claim they are comfortable discussing slavery in their classrooms, their teaching practices reveal profound lapses. Only slightly more than half or 52% of, of, of the 1700 uh, social studies teachers surveyed teach their students about slavery's legal roots in the nation's founding documents. Only 
of the 1700 social studies teacher survey teach their students about slavery's legal roots in the nation's founding document. Well, this ties into the this ties into the whole debate over reparations. Because if you don't understand the, the slavery's legal roots in this country, then you don't understand the need for laws to correct what was done. It, it, all this dealt with public policy, 246 years of slavery, decades of Jim Crow segregation, okay? The, the reallocation of hundreds of millions of acres of land, the theft of hundreds of millions of acres, acres of land, then the reallocation of that land, and African-Americans largely being locked out of that land giveaway. The Homestead Act of 1862 was redistributed about 250 million acres of land for, for, for 100 years. The Southern Homestead Act of 1866 was redistributed about 45 million acres of land in five states. The Dawes Allotment Act of 1887 was redistributed uh, uh, 138 million acres of land, okay? And, 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 and two thirds of that go to white people. Prior to all of this, going back to the 1600s and 1700s, when you deal with the Head, Heads right, the Head Rights Act, and white men coming to this country being given uh, uh, acres of land, uh, 50 acres of land, and then uh, additional acres for each slave that they own, okay? Being given this land because you're dealing with uh, British colonies and the colonies were set up to create wealth for England, okay? To establish colonies, to acquire this land, to put slaves on the land, enslaved Africans on this, on this land, produce the crops, produce products that England can sell to enrich England. Okay, so you're gonna have uh, Thomas Jefferson get free land, uh, the thousands of acres of free land. Uh, I think you got like 100,000 acres. You got George Washington has like about 70,000 acres of free land, uh, all of this, okay? So we have, to, we have to study this history, all right. And this history has to be properly taught in schools. So only slightly more than half or 52% teach their students about slavery's legal, uh, legal roots in the nation's founding documents, while just 53% uh, of teachers surveyed emphasize the extent of slavery outside of the antebellum South, okay? Talking about prior to the uh, Civil War. And 54% teach the continuing legacy of slavery in today's society. Only 54% of teachers teach the continuing legacy of slavery in today's societies. Now, Ursula Wolf Rocca, Ursula Wolf, uh, Wolf Rocca was a, uh, is a high school U.S. history teacher in Lake Oswego, Oregon, okay? And uh, she was interviewed by the Atlantic, or she was interviewed in the uh, in the study. And uh, she, uh, so she's in uh, uh, Portland, Oregon, Lake, Lake Oswego, uh, Oregon, uh, which is a Portland suburb. And she has encountered students' common misconceptions, such as the belief that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, which he did not. And it, that, was the, that was the 13th Amendment, was not the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863. And that the Civil War was really about states' rights, which it was not. It was fought over slavery. The South had seceded from the Union to maintain slavery, to maintain their way of life. If you read their statements of secession, they talk about this. Her straightforward solution is assigning original documents. Quote, she said, read Lincoln's first inaugural address and you do not find a fiery abolitionist, but someone promising to enforce the fugitive slave clause, read the articles of secession uh, from the states that seceded from the Union, starting with South Carolina, December 20th, 1860. But, uh, and, and you find striking declarations from slave states that their actions are rooted in a desire to protect slavery, end quote, she's absolutely correct. All right, so um, all right, so check out that article from uh, theatlantic.com, theatlantic.com, okay? That is what kids are really learning about slavery, what kids are really learning about slavery. And things that they recommend in the study to um, 
correct the way the history of slavery is taught is, let's see, look here, let's look at page 16. Um, it deals with key concepts. And then there was an article from uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com that also out, outlined this and outlined uh, how to correctly teach this. Let's see here. Look at summary. Okay, we have key concepts, page 16, and then I'm gonna look at the article from um, AtlantaBlackStar.com because I can get to it quickly. So AtlantaBlackStar.com had an article that talked about this study as well. And let's see, what's the name of that article? They lay out 10 ways to uh, better teach the history of slavery. Where is it? A second here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Most states fail to cover ten topics recommended to pro uh, provide students a clear understanding of slavery. Some scored zero. This is from AtlantaBlackStar.com, February tenth, two thousand eighteen, and this is about the study as well. And I thought that um, I guess. Page 16 lays out the key concepts. I guess that's what that is. It lays out 10 key concepts. Yeah, this deals with, so page 16 of the study lays out the key concepts, and this is designed to uh, help correct the way the history of slavery is taught. Um, so I'll share a few of them with you here. So slavery, which was practiced by Europeans prior to their arrival in the Americas was important to all of the colonial powers and existed in all of the European, uh, uh, European North American colonies. And let me see, do I have this in here? Okay, that's the Southern. All right. Uh, number two, slavery and the slave trade were central to the development and growth of the economy across British North America and later the United States. Three protections for slavery were embedded in the founding documents. Enslavers dominated uh, the federal government, Supreme Court, and U.S. Senate from 1787 to 1860. Okay, and that's a long, that's a long time actually to do that. And let me pull it up here. I have the study here, so let's look at it. Uh, page 16 here in the study. Uh, number four, slavery was an institution of power. Slavery was an institution of power designed to create uh, profit for the enslavers and uh, break the will, break the will of the enslaved and was a relentless quest for profit uh, abetted by racism. Okay, let's look at uh, page 16. Okay. All right. So number five, enslaved people resisted the efforts of their enslavers to reduce them to commodities in both revolutionary and everyday ways. Number six, so, so this contradicts that whole theory that slavery was a choice. Number six, the experience of slavery um, varied depending on time, location, crop, labor performed, size of slave holding, and gender, which is true. The history of slavery is a very nuanced history. So you have to understand which part of the country you were talking about, what period of time are you talking about, whether it's a large plantation, small plantation. It's a very nuanced history. Uh, number seven, slavery was the central cause of the Civil War. Number eight, slavery shaped the fundamental beliefs of Americans about race and whiteness, and white supremacy was both a product and legacy of slavery. Um, now, I, I, I disagree with that. The, the ideology of white supremacy, even though it was not called white supremacy 
early on. That ideology predated the system of slavery, gave birth to it. And that ideology we see is, is this is why you have to understand the history of the Africans known as the Moors. Because the, the Moors are starting to be dehumanized, we see going back to about the 12th or 13th century. Okay, and this is going the, the way that the Moors uh, are looked at and perceived and talked about begins to change, and we see them being dehumanized. The, the dehumanization of African people didn't start with the transatlantic slave trade, it goes back prior to that, and it goes back. It goes back to the, the relationship between the Africans known as the Moors who go into the Iberian Peninsula in 711 AD, today known as Spain and Portugal. They go all throughout Europe. They take the teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt into Europe, and it brings Europe out of the Dark Ages. And this is some of the history that, that I want to deal with in the online course that I teach. Um, dealing with ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach in school. And this is. Uh, the uh, 2000, 2019 edition, okay? 2019 edition. This is some of the things that I'm going to deal with in the class. All right. But these teachers are going to bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. They're going to lead to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. They lead to Christopher Columbus setting sail on his first of four voyages, August 3rd, 1492. Okay. Uh, so slavery shaped the fundamental beliefs of Americans about race and whiteness. Uh, number nine, enslaved and free people of African descent had a profound impact on American culture, producing leaders and literary, artistic, and folk traditions, traditions that continue to influence the nation. And number 10, by knowing how to read and interpret the sources that tell the story of American slavery, we gain insight into some of what enslaving, enslaving and enslaved Americans aspire to, created thought and desire. Okay, so that's from page 16 of uh, the uh, study, Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. How's everybody doing? How's Latoya, Wesley, uh, and Toya? Uh, how are you all doing? If you want more information about the online course that we have starting up, uh, June 8th, 2019, email me at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, also, uh, we'll have the information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So this is a um, updated version of the online course I last taught September 2017. There's been a lot of there's been a lot of discoveries that have come out since then, archaeological discoveries, et cetera. So we'll deal with a lot of that in the online course, okay? It's a uh, eight session, 14 hour online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And you can watch from around the world, it'll be archived, watch over and over again also. All right, let me, let me deal uh, with a little bit of what we'll cover in the online course. If you've taken the course before, you'll be able to register for this one at a 50% discount as well. So this class will be $80. It's a 16 hour online course. I teach it. We have uh, numerous book references, uh, book sources, about 50 articles. We'll cover thousands of years of history. You don't have to read any of these books to be able to follow along in the class, but I'm using it for reference. All right, let's let's uh, let's look at some of these slides. I do a PowerPoint presentation as well. These are some of the slides from the uh, actual class. We'll talk some about the film Black Panther as well uh, in the course also, because that ties in the African history uh, also. But here's some of the things that we, that I, that I deal with in online course. Let's see, go to slide 17. All right, so we do a, what was the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting. I approach this chronologically as opposed to episodically. The transatlantic slave trade was not an episode in history that just popped out of the thin air. Thin air. It was the culmination of a sequence of historical events that lead up to this taking place. Uh, what role did Christopher Columbus play? Columbus is central to the transatlantic slave trade spreading. Okay, Columbus is central 
to the spread of the transatlantic slave trade, even though it did not start with Columbus. When did Africans first come to the U.S. as slaves? So, you know, this year we celebrating a lot of people celebrating August 20th, 1619. And they say this is when African people first came to this country as slaves, or some say this is when we first came to this country. Uh, both are wrong. Number one, we've been in this land that we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. And if you read the book, The First Americans Were Africans, documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel, which is one of the sources for the course, one of the books I use in the course, the, Dr. David M. Hotel thoroughly documents that history, okay? Uh, African people have been in this land we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years. These were the Khoisan. The Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. They come from Southern Africa. They go uh, all around the world. And they were in this land as well, okay? And they're building the, uh, the these were the early mound builders. They're building mounds up and down the Mississippi River. There were about a million mounds in this land we call the United States. Today, there are only about 100,000. The largest one that's still there is called Cahokia, which is in um, East Illinois, Cahokia, okay? But this is, this is our history. So we can't deal with the transatlantic slave trade in 1440 or 15th century. We have to deal with thousands of years of history prior to that. All right, so let's continue here. Um, so when the slaves first come to the U.S., so August 20, 16, 19, 19, Jamestown, Virginia did happen. At that time, slave statutes did not even exist in the 13 colonies. The first slave statute does not come until 1641. That's in Massachusetts. This is one of the things we'll deal with in the class. The, the understanding of the history of slavery is a very nuanced history. The Spanish were taking Africans into the territory we call South Carolina going back to uh, the 1520s, specifically 1526. And you have Moors who are being kicked out of uh, Spain, who are being enslaved by the Spanish, taken into Spanish territories like Florida and South Carolina. So even though the transatlantic slave trade did happen, but you have some African Moors who are being enslaved and taken in, in, and brought to this country as well. The Spanish territories, okay? It's a different history than the, it's a different government the Spanish territories under a different government than the English colonies, okay? Those are different, it's a different history. Did Africans sell themselves into slavery? So we'll deal with that complicated history because it's not, it didn't exactly happen the way oftentimes it's, the history is told. Were African people in America before the slave trade? Absolutely, this was our land stolen from us and it's been stolen numerous times. We deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, shocking archeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. And there's some new discoveries that we have to talk about. Insurance companies that uh, took out insurance policies on slave ships and enslaved Africans on the plantations. Um, Freemasonry, America and the founding fathers, origins of the term Africa and America. That's Renoko Rashidi there who referenced some of his books in the class. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, Malcolm X, uh, the media, he said, Mal Malcolm said, the media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and the guilty innocent, and that's power because they control the minds of the masses. Let me see, I'm trying to stop the screen share. All right. Okay. So these are just uh, some of the things that we deal with in the uh, online course. Let's bring the screen share back up. All right, so this is Dr. David M. Hotep and his book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, which came out in 2011. His book documents, uh, his book has 713 footnotes, thoroughly documents an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. Uh, on page 14 of his book, he deals with a discovery by Dr. Albert Goodyear, who's an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. He, uh, Dr. Albert Goodyear made a discovery in Allendale County, South Carolina in 2004. 2004. 15 years ago, and uh, they found 13 different pieces of evidence, 13 different types of evidence that thoroughly documented African presence in this country, going back at least 51,700 years ago. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints in lava, genetic M174 dehaploids, uh, dehaploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeleton structures, and tools. 
Now, his new book comes out July 2019. If everything goes right, I talked to him about two or three weeks ago. His new book is called The First Americans Were Africans Revisited. The First Americans Were Africans Revisited has about 200 additional pages. He has a lot more um, information, new research uh, in the book. So it's going to be deep. It's going to blow people away. This is Dr. Albert Goodyear, archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. This is an article from 2004, November 18, 2004, from ScienceDaily.com that talks about his discovery. Uh, it's called New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. Okay. And this is a, uh, here's a synopsis. Here's a summary of his uh, discovery. This is the summary from ScienceDaily.com. A radiocarbon test of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina uh, archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. Okay, now this article is still there. You can go read it, read it uh, now, sciencedaily.com. Okay, so see, these are some of the things that we deal with, some of the archaeological discoveries, things like this. This is a discovery that was made in, uh, was, it was revealed in 2013. They actually made the discovery about 13 years before that. This is the lost city of Egypt called Tanis Heraklion, which was lost about 1,200 years ago. It was swallowed into the sea, and uh, it was believed to be built around 8th century B.C. Uh, these are some of the discoveries they made at the bottom of the sea, 16-foot-tall uh, statues, a uh, statue of Osset or Isis. Uh, they found... Uh, they found 64 ships that were buried uh, 150 feet uh, beneath the sea, 16 foot tall statues, uh, 700 anchors. It was a huge discovery. I talked about it then, uh, back then when it was revealed back in 2013. So we deal with uh, a lot of archaeological discoveries and, and deal with history leading up to the transatlantic slave trade. We have to talk about the history of the Moors who lose control of their last stronghold, Granada, January 2nd, 1492. The Moors are taking the teachings of ancient Kemet into Europe. The teachings uh, uh, and, and these teachings are going to be taught to Europeans. And uh, a watered down version of these teachings are make up Freemasonry, form the foundation of Freemasonry. When we look at a lot of symbols that we see in Europe, even symbols here in the US, they have an African root or they come from Africa, this African symbology. When we look at the Washington Monument, Washington Monument, 555 feet tall. Tony Browder talks about this in Egypt on the Potomac. That's one of the books we use in the class as well. Um, the Washington Monument is an ancient African symbol called a Tekken or an obelisk, which comes from the story of Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. And there were about 1,200 Tekken New all throughout Europe today, uh, all throughout Kemet, ancient Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt. Today, they're only about 12 left. They've been taken to other parts of the world or destroyed, taken to places like Istanbul, Turkey, and Vatican City, Paris, France, etc. But when we look at the word Mason, the word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and sun. And Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term child of light or sons and daughters alike, because we taught women as well, we didn't discriminate, was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. And many other Masonic temples were modeled after temples uh, of ancient Kemet, places where light and knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees, steps or degrees. Read pages 18 and 32 of uh, Egypt on the Baton by Tony Browder. So when we look at you going to college and getting your credentials in a series of degrees, that comes out of ancient Kemet. When we look at the seven liberal arts, that they originate in ancient Kemet, okay, in the, in the schools they were, where the mystery systems were taught. Um, George G.M. James talks about this in Stolen Legacy. He talks about the, the trivium and the quadrivium, the three and the four. He talks about the seven liberal arts. Um, so historically, light was associated with knowledge. When we look at uh, the description here, historically, light was associated with knowledge. Okay, 
So when we talk about Europe being in the dark ages, it's a, it's, it's a period of time, you know, hundreds of years of ignorance, lack of enlightenment. And then when we look at it's the Moors that bring Europe out of the dark ages, that next age going into basically like the 15th century, uh, late 1400s, early 1500s, or you know, going into uh, actually the 16th century, but uh, late 1400s, uh, 15th century, and going into the 16th century, that period of time is called the Renaissance age, a time of it, a time of enlightenment, light, a time of enlightenment, going into the age of knowledge, the Renaissance. So um, they talk about how you had uh, the child, the child of light, and sons of daughters of light. Why? Because light was associated with knowledge. Okay, and when you look at say cartoons, even today. If you have a cartoon character, whether it's Doc McStuffins or Mickey Mouse or Dora the Explorer, they get a bright idea, a light bulb goes off over their head, light associated with knowledge. When you have a child that is said to be a dim-witted child, D-I-M, lack of light, meaning unintelligent or dumb or what have you. Okay, so... Uh, and then 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. So when we see the layout of Washington, D.C., we see the layout of Washington, D.C. is based upon ancient African principles, right? And the layout of Washington, D.C. is a copy of ancient Egypt. We know Benjamin Banneker was the surveyor who did the layout of Washington, D.C. Well, Browder talks about in Egypt on the Potomac, he shows you how the layout of Washington, D.C. is a copy of ancient Egypt. The layout of ancient Egypt. And we know 13 of the 13 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons also. Okay. So here's uh, Asar Aset Heru, who the Greeks call uh, Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Asar is in the middle. Okay. And we see uh, Aset, who the Greeks call Isis with the, with the horns and the sun disc. Okay. This is ancient African history. And we see that Aset was copied, culturally appropriated by DC Comics in the 1970s TV show called The Secrets of Isis, where they depicted this white woman as being Isis. If you watch the show, last time, uh, a few years ago, I know they had episodes on Hulu, the streaming service Hulu. They talk about in the beginning of the show how she gets her powers from ancient Egypt, but she, she's a white woman. And they ain't tell you that the ancient Egyptians were African people, that Aset or Isis was an African woman. OK, in the story and the mythology. And then we see from and, and so we see Europeans were worshiping the black Madonna and child for hundreds of years. The black Madonna and child. Which comes from our set in Heru and then from the black Madonna and child, as you have a rise in white supremacy and a rise in the European phenotype, then you're going to have the decolorized version promoted. OK, but they still have uh, statues of the black Madonna and child all throughout Europe. Uh, today that still exists, okay. We have uh, Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, Nilly Fuller as well. Uh, I'm trying to get to uh, trying to find these. Uh, let me see if there any other slides I need to get to. Oh, okay, yeah, this is one. This is one I wanted to show you. So when we deal with um, very quickly here, when I was talking about the Moors, when we look at, uh, for instance the impact that the Moors had on Europeans. These are the, the national flags of um, the islands, the French island of Corsica uh, with the blue background and the Italian island in the Mediterranean of Sardinia. They have Moors heads on their flags right now, okay? Because the Moors were in those areas, took a monumental effort to conquer them. And originally, the, the, you, you see they're wearing bandanas. Originally, these bandanas were blindfolds that symbolized that they were prisoners. But because of tourism and being politically correct, they turned the bandanas, they turned the blindfolds into bandanas. But, uh, you know, I first saw this in a Renoko Rashidi's book, um, his book, Black Star, the African Presence in Early Europe. Okay. And this is one of the books that I, I reference in the class also. Black Star, the African Presence in Early Europe from uh, Renoko Rashidi. I've written a few Renoko a number of times. And I, I saw, I was preparing for an interview that I was doing with them about this book. Uh, this was back in like 2011, 2012. 
and I saw the um, I, I saw he had those pictures of the flags in his book. So I started doing research on it. And I'm like, whoa, I said, this is deep. Now, I'd, I had already read Golden Age of the Moor. So I was familiar with a lot of this. And, and Renoko has a uh, essay in uh, the book Golden Age of the Moor as well, which is one of the best books dealing with the, uh, the history of the Moors during medieval time. But he shows you... Uh, he shows you those flags in this book also. Okay. I'm just trying to see if I can find it. I thought I had it bookmarked. But this is a, I mean, this is a really deep book here. Uh, Black Star, the African Presence in Early Europe. Okay. I guess I can't. Let's see. That's the herald we, but here are some of the images of the black, the statues of the black Madonna and child that is still in Europe today. Okay. And this right here is the flag of uh, Sardinia. This is the flag of Sardinia, uh, flag of Sardinia, Italy with four Moors heads. All right. This is from pages 90 and 91 of um, Black Star. The African Presence in Early Europe by Renoko Rashidi. Visit his website, Renoko, drrenoko.com, drrenoko.com. Visit his website because um, I think you can order his books there. I know he does tours of different countries in Africa as well, so check him out for that also. Okay, and then when we look at Christopher Columbus, uh, like I said, it's, it's really important to study Columbus because uh, Columbus helps to spread the uh, Columbus helps with the spread of the the transatlantic slave trade and the spread of white supremacy and racism slavery capitalism exploitation Columbus helps to really lay the foundation for uh, racism capitalism exploitation of indigenous people helps to spread slavery but what, one of the things that's important to understand about Columbus is that he never came to the land that we call the United States of America. Columbus never came to the land that we call the United States of America. The closest Columbus comes here is uh, Cuba, which is 90 miles away, okay? So when we look at his first voyage, he set sail August 3rd, 1492 in the Nina, the Penta, and the Santa Maria. Uh, and he goes to the Bahamas, which he calls San Salvador, San Salvador. He goes to Cuba and Hispaniola. You know, Hispaniola becomes Haiti. Um, his second voyage, September 1493, he goes into the West Indies and it goes into uh, what we call Puerto Rico or Bariquan, goes into Jamaica in 1494. His third voyage, May of 1498, goes into Trinidad and Venezuela and he goes into South America a little bit. His fourth voyage, May of 1504, he goes to the Panama and Honduras in Central America. He never comes to the land that we call the United States of America. The closest he comes here is Cuba, which is 90 miles away. Now, as Dr. David M. Hotep talks about in his book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence, 70%, at least 70% of the people Columbus encountered on his four voyages were African people, at least 70%. Okay, so uh, this is a very, very deep history. All right, who do we have here? How's everybody doing? So uh, email us at customer service at African History Network dot com. Uh, customer service at African History Network dot com. We'll give you the information for the uh, online course we have starting up. And uh, we'll have the information also at our website, African History Network dot com, right on the home page. OK, that website I was talking about was Dr. Renoco dot com. Dr. R-U-N-O-K-O, Dr. Renoco dot com. I misspelled it. Yeah, we'll post it here, drrenoco.com, okay? And then also email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. Um, we'll let you know, we'll give you the information about uh, registering for the online course that, that, I, that I'm teaching starting up June 8th. 
2019. It's an eight-week online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Mahafa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach in school. And this class will be live and it'll be archived. So if you miss any of it, you can go back and watch it over and over again. Yeah, Renoko is on Facebook. We're Facebook friends. Uh, just search for Renoko Rashidi, R-U-N-O-K-O, uh, R-U-N-O-K-O, R-A-S-H-I-D-I, Renoko Rashidi. Uh, search for him on Facebook. And he has a fan page. He has like 100,000 followers, um, uh, his Facebook fan page. All right. Okay, so if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, uh, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show that helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, finance our Sunday night show as well. Um, local... Uh, uh, um, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show or at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. Be sure to listen to uh, uh, Sunday show. We're on every Sunday, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we broadcast on 9, 10 a.m. on the, the Superstation, WFDF in Detroit. We broadcast on Facebook Live also. This show is going to be fantastic, so you don't want to miss that as well. And uh, we'll continue our coverage dealing with uh, impeachment, impeachment of Trump, what is impeachment, uh, why he should be impeached, things like this. We'll deal with some other stories also. Hmm. All right. So let me uh, see if there's anything else. I think I, I think I got everything. But once again, this um, it, this talks about it, when we deal with the stories um, dealing with slave lessons, history lessons gone wrong in school. We have to understand how this traumatizes African-American students. So we talked about uh, black students depicted as slaves in mock slave auction. State investigation finds ha had a profoundly negative effect on all the students, especially African-American students. So this is why the history of slavery has to be correctly taught in schools across the country. This is why um, this study here from the Southern Poverty Law Center, Teaching Hard History of American Slavery, is so important, okay? And you can download this from uh, splcenter.org, Southern Poverty Law Center's website, splcenter.org. And also the online course that I teach, uh, this is why this is so important. And, and you can, the uh, students, children can uh, watch the online course also. So it's not vulgar. I don't do, I don't curse. It's not vulgar. Uh, it's not uh, overly graphic with horrific details. Uh, you know, things like that. We, you know, we deal with, we talk about slavery some, but it's not um, horrifically graphic, okay, also. So it's suitable for uh, 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 children and teenagers. All right, okay, look. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. We have to get out of here. Uh, follow us on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P on YouTube. Uh, subscribe there and also uh, click on the bell so you're notified when we go live when we upload new videos follow us on our facebook fan page the african history network the african history network turn on notifications there as well and uh, remember at the african history network we focus on educating empowering and inspiring people of african descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior what you do for yourself what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. I'll talk to you next time. Peace.